So welcome everybody. Um, thanks very much for coming. Thanks especially if you've come back after seeing previous sessions. Welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about writing for luxury. We have myself, I'm founder and creative director Mike Reed at Reed Words. Uh, we also have Sam Russell, one of our senior writers, and Sam Pollan, our deputy creative director. Uh, we're going to be helping out and we have a special guest in Erin from Penn Halligans who's going to introduce herself properly uh, shortly. So before we get into all that, just to explain how this works, if you've not been to one of these before. Um, sorry that we've muted everybody, but um, much as we'd like to have a kind of general chat, there's just too many people. So you are on mute, please stay there. Um, we'll talk around this subject for about 25 minutes or so and then um, open it up for questions and answers at the end. So if you do have comments, questions as we go along, please do type them into the chat and um, address them to everyone so we can all see them. And uh, it's going to be my job this time to keep an eye on that and bring the questions in at the end. So I'll be watching that. Um, just to, before we get there, just to introduce Read Words a little bit. Um, very briefly, we are a brand writing agency um, doing every variety of language. <laughs> we talk about delivering the world's brightest words. So bright as in clever and strategic and bright as in creative and colorful and all those good things. Um, we do this for a whole range of clients in all manner of sectors, as you can see, um, from the very big to the really tiny. We work for kind of one, two person startups as well as the, the really big international names. So it's a really good bed of experience, I think, there to draw on. Um, and since we're talking about luxury, I thought we should reveal some of our uh, luxury work over the years. So here's a um, selection of the luxury focused brands that we've helped out. Again, you can see that they go across various sectors from the art world to restaurants and travel and of course Penhaligans as well. Um, so again I think a good rich bed of experience. Um, so we're going to hand over quickly to Erin. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself Erin and what you do? Sure yeah hello everybody thank you for having me. Um, I'm the senior brand content manager for Penhaligans. Um, so I head up the team that looks after the global um, content and communications across all channels. Um, I've been doing that for nearly nine years now, so I'm uh, I'm well versed in the in the world of Penhaligans. Uh, for those of you that aren't, then um, we are a British luxury fragrance house. Uh, we've been around for many moons. We are actually celebrating our our 150th year this year, so uh, we know a thing or two about making fragrance. Uh, yep, so founded in 1870, William Penhaligon uh, travelled from Cornwall to London, set up shop, um, started making concoctions and fragrances, very much inspired by the world around him, and uh, and yeah, they, they went down a treat, and here we are, 150 years later. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Pen Halligans has a really interesting tone of voice as well, so I'm especially uh, happy to have you guys along for this. Um, so, writing for luxury. Um, I'm going to step back at this point. I think everyone's heard quite enough from me over these webinars and let Sam and Sam take over. And as I say, I should be watching the Q&A uh, in the chat. So do put your questions there. Okay, I shall hand over. Great, thanks, Mike. Hello, everyone. I'm Sam R. Sam P will be talking later on. Um, so writing for luxury um, well first things first what exactly does luxury sound like um, if you've joined one of these webinars before you'll know that um, that's often language can be quite hard to pin down and quite tricky to describe um, so what we wanted to do now is show a few examples of different ways luxury is being used and talk about some of the problems and some of the potential opportunities for a luxury brand because really we all have probably quite a strong sense of what luxury sounds like, but at the same time that might be very subjective. And one person's idea of luxury might be another person's idea of lackluster, or your idea of, my, of luxury might sound very sort of flashy and over the top to me. So because luxury covers so many different sectors like cars and watches and jewelry and fragrances, can sometimes be hard for a writer or for a brand to figure out what exactly should luxury writing sound like. So for example, here we have uh, Tesco's luxury soft gentle white tissues, which they're describing as beautifully soft and gentle to the touch. Now, is that luxury? Is that what we mean by luxury writing? 
uh, is this is this luxury writing? This is Marks and Spencer's luxury gold tea bags, which they're describing as exceptional quality, fresh from the tea garden. Now the language here is slightly more premium sounding, you know, exceptional quality. But again, is this what we mean by luxury writing? Is this uh, this is Princess, which is a, a speedboat brand, um, and uh, the the headline here, smooth, suave, sophisticated. I mean the boat, of course. Is that luxury? Or is that a bit naff and a bit old fashioned and a bit try hard? Again, is that what we mean when we're talking about luxury writing? And then finally, this is Claridge's um, set in the heart of Mayfair. Claridge's is an art deco icon and a byword for timeless elegance. Since the 1850s, Claridge's has excelled at the finer things in life. Glamorous design, inspiring dining, impeccable service. You know, very, very formal, slightly old fashioned, slightly stuffy writing. Again, is that what we mean by luxury writing? Well, to help the conversation and to show you some of the possibilities for luxury writing and some of the different directions it could go in, we have created six voice personas which we think can be useful for a luxury brand trying to figure out how it should use language. Um, they all sound slightly different from one another um, and some of them will be right for some brands and some of them won't, but we think hopefully by walking through them we can kind of start to see all the different shades that luxury writing can come in. So we've got the butler, the storyteller, the poet, the show-off, the minimalist and the joker. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk through each of these personas, show you an example or two of brands that we think are using them in their writing, and then talk about some of the, some of the positives that this persona brings and some of the potential negatives. So first things first, the butler. Um, this is often the sort of first port of call for a luxury brand, you know, formal, sophisticated, slightly stuffy language can be right for a luxury brand that's been around for hundreds of years and that, you know, particularly for British luxury brands as well, it kind of conveys a sense of history and kind of authority. So someone like British Airways, for example, you know, their line to fly, to serve, well, that's very much the butler talking there, talking about serving and suggesting at the same time that, um, British Airways is a brand full of heritage and history and that it's, it's not at all like EasyJet or Ryanair or, or one of the other low-class carriers. Another brand, another British brand like Asprey, again, trades a lot on its history and when you can see the way that it talks about itself, it does so with a very formal, very kind of sophisticated voice. So founded in 1781, the house has historically been recognised as one of the world's preeminent luxury goods brands. You know, even a phrase like the house, for example, you know, they could have said we, they could have said Asprey. Instead, they're describing themselves as the house, which again feels, feels bigger than just a brand, feels part of history. Now, that's great if the history is there and if that's something you want to communicate. It can, however, make your brand feel slightly out of step with the modern world. And when you come up against slightly newer, fresher brands, it can make you feel a bit kind of stuffy and maybe a little bit stiff. The next persona is the storyteller. And as you can imagine, this is a brand that uh, tells stories about its products that doesn't just describe the products. Instead, it, it kind of provides extra information that brings it to life and creates a certain mood or atmosphere. Um, Fiji Water do this a lot. This is you know, the self-proclaimed Earth's finest water. And you can see when they talk about themselves, they, they overload it with detail. So on a remote Pacific island, 1600 miles from the nearest continent, uh, equatorial trade winds purify the clouds that begin Fiji Water's journey through one of the world's last virgin ecosystems. Now, they could have said Fiji Water comes from Fiji. Instead, they're describing it as a remote Pacific island, 1600 miles away from the nearest continent, which adds a sense of mystery and drama and excitement to what is frankly a pretty, pretty functional, pretty basic product. You know, they could have also said something like, you know, our water comes from rainwater. Instead, they're describing the equatorial trade winds that purify the clouds. So again, every detail, there's a lot of emphasis on kind of puffing it up and emphasizing how special or unique it is. Now that can work in small doses. And if there's a compelling story to tell, the risk is that, and I think Fiji water have kind of fallen into it, is that occasionally the writing starts to feel kind of slow and heavy and the reader loses interest. The next persona is the poet, which does a very similar job to the storyteller, 
but does it with a little bit more lyrical flair. So he uses language in a slightly more creative or interesting way. So it's not just about giving the reader lots of information about the product or the process or the, the sort of tradition behind it. Instead, it's kind of using slightly sharper bits of language to help create an idea or a mood. So Aesop, the British skincare brand, this is how they talk about their hand balm. Modest instruments to which we owe our daily comforts, the hands deserve care befitting their unflinching service. Accordingly, consider richly aromatic cleansers and balms that hydrate, nourish and soften. Now that's a pretty long winded way of saying, use our hand cream to take care of your hands. But bits of language like modest instruments or richly aromatic cleansers, they feel unusual and distinctive. And they're, yeah, they're a bit more remarkable than Fiji Water, who were just kind of loading on, on the uh, detail to the reader. Penn Halligans, uh, obviously Erin um, will know a lot about this. Um, they take a similar approach. Um, this is something that we worked on uh, last year, and this is a product description for the Castile fragrance. Um, the product description had to be very, very short, and it needed to work for search. So unlike Fiji water, we didn't have a lot of room to play with. You don't have sentences and sentences that you can kind of stuff with lots of detail. Instead, you, use, you need to use kind of alliteration and rhythm and all those little lyrical tricks to help create a, a mood and an atmosphere. So on a Spanish hillside, orange blossom and neroli spill their sunborn scent. Again, it, it doesn't tell us about how the product is made, why the bottle is the shape it is, you know, uh, where it comes from necessarily. Instead, it just kind of creates a, an atmosphere and a, and a story to tell. Next, we have the show off. And this is for those brands that are supremely self-confident in their story and what, who they are. Um, let's look at Grey Goose as an example of this, the self-proclaimed world's best tasting vodka. Um, the way they use language is kind of bold and active and a little bit bolshy. And it's all about the kind of authority that they have as a premium brand. So saying your vodka is gluten-free isn't unique, full stop, grey gooses. Writing handmade on a bottle is easy, making grey gooses not. You know, they're not only talking about themselves here, they're kind of talking about other brands as well. And the way that some of those brands are inauthentic or, or not quite as impressive as grey goose. So this is great for a brand that, has total self-confidence and has a product to, to back it up it becomes a problem when there's a disconnect between the two when the language doesn't quite match the product and that people's experience of the brand isn't reflected in the way you're talking about it next up we have the minimalist um, and really the point here is that sometimes the best way to sell a luxury brand and talk about a premium brand is to is to say hardly anything at all um, We'll take a look at Jill Sander, the fashion brand here, who are, who's known as kind of the queen of less for very understated collections. That understatement is, is carried through in the way that they use language. So this is an Instagram post. Um, and you can see here the language is, is so functional, so neutral, that there's almost no tone to it. There's no attempt to tell a story. So Damien standing in front of a church documented by Olivier Curvin, Gibellina, Sicily, October 2019. It's giving us the basic information, but nothing more. And instead, it's letting the imagery and the clothes do, do all of the heavy work. Now that works really well for fashion brands where the emphasis is often on the imagery rather than the language. It can become a problem for a brand that, that doesn't have anything to back it up, that doesn't have that kind of compelling imagery to, to do the job of the writing. And then finally, the Joker. Um, and this is a personal favorite of mine because I think it, it helps create a kind of fresh and contemporary feel for a brand. Um, it's a tricky one to get right though. Obviously spending lots of money is a serious business and you don't want people to think that your brand isn't serious or not worth it, worth spending time with. But if it's, if it's handled delicately, it can help create a much more, I think, modern feeling um, and kind of suggest a real self-confidence to a brand. So the example we're gonna look at is Hermes. And again, one of their Instagram posts. Now, here there's absolutely nothing about the product. There's nothing about the, the process that went behind it. There's nothing about the material. Instead, there's just a pun, chairman of the board. But with that comes, yeah, a self-confidence, almost as though Hermes is saying, we don't really need to sell to you. You know, you know our qualities. You, you kind of know we're worth spending time with. So instead, we're going to take this as an opportunity to 
to have a little bit of fun and display a bit of wit and a bit of uh, yeah, a bit of our sense of humor rather than do anything as grubby as kind of selling a product or talking about a product. So handled well, and if it's the right brand and you've got the imagery and the confidence to back it up, it can be a really nice way of, of yeah, kind of feeling more contemporary and more modern. So there are personas. Hopefully they show um, some of the different directions that a luxury voice can go into. I think one of the traps that luxury brands fall into is, is yeah, just automatically opting for the butler, feeling like we're a luxury brand, so our language needs to feel formal and premium and slightly old fashioned. But actually luxury increasingly comes in so many different shapes and sizes that there are more opportunities for language than we might think. Um, to help us kind of bring some of those ideas to life, I'm gonna turn over to Sam P now, who's going to walk us through three ways that you can write for luxury and kind of help tell a more compelling story. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, there's, we've obviously covered a kind of range of possibilities here. And, and what we wanted to then do is bring out, well, what are the commonalities here? What are the things that apply um, across these different types of voice and these different, these different types of brands that, that are all called luxury, but are actually doing quite different things. Um, and we've boiled that down to three things. Things, as you know, if you've uh, attended any of these previously, you know, I think good advice always comes in threes. <laughs> Uh, so number one, tell a story. Number two, show, don't tell. And number three, leave it to the imagination. So we'll, we'll go through those very quickly with some examples and terms. So telling a story. Um, I, feel, I feel like storytelling, uh, someone mentioned in the chat that luxury is kind of very uh, degraded and overused term in some ways. And I think storytelling is similar, certainly in, in the copy world. People talk about storytelling all the time. What, what do they actually mean? Well, I think in the luxury world, it does actually have some meaning because it's about kind of capturing people's imagination. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but luxury brands are often about, you know, transporting people to that, that different world that feels outside of their everyday and feels kind of fantastical and wonderful. Um, there's lots of ways and places you can do that. So that I think we, we naturally think of kind of ads and, you know, the car ad where someone's driving through a forest and everything's lovely and, you know, that. But actually, I think some of the most powerful storytelling luxury brands can do happens in, 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 uh, in little bits and pieces around, um, around their brand. So this is, uh, we're referring back to Penhaligons here for obvious reasons, but this is uh, Penhaligons, they have this, you know, um, even when Erin was talking, talking through what Penhaligon was all about, she started with the story of William Penhaligon because that's a lovely story that kind of brings to life this brand and immediately places it in history and kind of gives you this um, affinity with it. And the man who set a thousand noses twitching, you know, they tell the story on the website as well um, in a really lovely way that kind of, that, that is fun and that embodies that um, tone of voice we talked about, but also just makes you picture this world. Um, and that's true even down to the real details. So uh, this is, you know, um, the ones, I will read this out to you. So one's privacy is paramount. Ben Halligans will never di divulge your data to third parties, Scout's Honor. Um, so there's a little touch of personality in, in this very, you know, this is about data privacy, not terribly interesting. Erin, um, if I could come over to you uh, for this, I'd love to kind of, ask you that question of what, what what value do you think that adds you know this is something that 95 percent of people who visit the Penhaligon's website will never see and will never notice um but i think it creates a really nice moment and i'd love to hear hear kind of your perspective on on what you think words can do in this with those little touches yeah um absolutely i think i think it's it's incredibly important i think you touched on it a little bit when i in in luxury and a luxury strategy First and foremost, you're really asking the customer to buy into the brand. You know, it's, it's less about selling the product. It's more about fueling a dream, um, building incomparability and, and, and creating desirability. And, and so you're sort of, you're building this entire world. And these moments that you see here, you know, that obviously they have a function, but they're all, you have to make sure that every part of your world is, is covered in it with your tone of voice and that you're heard everywhere. I think. The moment you stop doing that and the moment that things start to become afterthoughts then then the bubble bursts and you know you're not you're you, 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 you're not keeping that relationship with the customer going at, at all times and and as i say it's that it's that 
incomparability it's it's don't do as other people do every opportunity you can as a luxury brand stick to your values and mm. and be true to them and, and for Penhaligons, you know part of our values are um poetry and playfulness and 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 that has to come in in in, in every aspect of our writing yeah Great. And um, it, it, it makes me think of that sort of attention to detail being such an important thing for luxury brands. And, and, and you know, that's true of the copy as well. People, people spot the things that, are, that just don't feel quite right. Um, we, we, we uh, just moving on to a, this, a slightly mean comparison, but I think there's also an interesting lesson here in, in that can go too far. And there's a balance to be struck um, for any brand, you know, brand is, exists to, to sell product and, and, and you know, um, make money fundamentally. Um, and I think there's an interesting example. So this is some copy from Aesop that is doing a kind of similar thing to that, that copy from Halligan's that is, is to, to my taste, and this is definitely a taste thing, uh, maybe pushes it a little bit far because it's a little bit hard to kind of get your head around what they're actually talking about here. So an affable reminder from across the ether. Recently, we wrote to check whether you were still interested in receiving our dispatches. We write occasionally about our formulation, stores, events, and cultural interests. If you do wish to stay in touch, kindly confirm your subscription. So I think that, you know, that's a taste thing. Um, and I think there's a balance that every luxury band has to strike between really bringing life to life that story and that personality and also being clear, particularly on, in an online context about, you know, what, why, they're, why they're there and what they're asking you to do. Um, there are different ways to tell a story. We've obviously kind of um, looked at some brands that are, that are doing it in a poetic, kind of fantastical, uh, way there but I think it's worth saying that lots of um, luxury brands take a different approach so um, just a just a comparison here so Aesop which we've already looked at has that very sort of lyrical style formulations can still aromatic quietude while stimulating senses that's that's you know really lovely and, and really poetic and um, Keels which is another brand kind of in a similar market se sector and um, I'm not going to go through this copy you'll be uh, pleased to uh, know but um, loads and loads of product detail um, and I think if you think of you know car brands and watches that are, that are often sold on kind of tech specs and you know the people who love those products and are kind of into those products and are buying those products um, are one making very you know carefully considered decisions and two really love the detail um, and that's that's a kind of storytelling it's a very different kind of storytelling but it's still about sort of bringing to life that world and, and, and really kind of teasing and engaging the customers you're aiming at so that's that's the kind of general. I, re I realise that's a very whistle stop tour of storytelling, but I think that's it. You know, that's the fundamental thing that all luxury brands should be thinking about. Um, showing, not telling. This is obviously if you have ever read a book on writing or had any writing um, teaching or anything like that, people tell you to show, don't tell, um, as a kind of maxim. Um, but what does that actually mean? Uh, what does that? What you know? When, when we when we how do we unpick that and actually like what does that mean? Dave? today so we think it's about creating a picture in in the reader's mind um, and finding a different way in that feels unexpected and makes them makes them see the scene you're describing see their life with the product see that history you're taking them through rather than just telling them what it is so a very uh, example that we've put together here and um, this is a you know a made up switch Swiss watch brand. So they could say only the best Swiss craftspeople make our watches. They have decades of experience making fine timepieces. That's why other brands simply don't compare. And that has a kind of you know referring back to those personas, those personalities we were talking about. That has a kind of butlerish tone to it, and it's perfectly nice and it's perfectly accurate. But they could also say this is Matteo. He's been making watches for forty years. Around here we call him the newbie. And it's kind of the same information. The lesson you get out of it is similar, but you get it in this way that makes you think about Matteo and makes you think about this sense of humor and just, and just captures your imagination in a very different way. And that's what's what showing rather than telling is all about. Um, here's a nice example from the, from the work we've done Pen, with Penhaligans here. Um, lavender and sandalwood rub shoulders in the fragrant Turkish baths of Mayfair. So again, the technical detail there is that this this um, perfume includes lavender and sandalwood, but actually we've embedded it in this image of of this place, and you and you are transported to these Turkish baths, and you see them, right? You see them in your mind when you read that. You can't really help doing it. 
Um, uh, so it's showing you and it's, it's kind of bringing that scene to life for you rather than just describing the ingredients. Um, which I think brings, brings to a really interesting point of, uh, of kind of the way that luxury brands maybe differ from other brands. Um, and as Sam talked about a bit about that at the top and that kind of diffuse definition of luxury. But I think for the true luxury brands, there's often the engagement that they have with the customer is different. Um, it is deeper, the purchasing, because the, you know, they tend to be more expensive, the purchasing decision is, all, is often a little bit more thought goes into it, it takes a little bit more time, they're thinking about that, they want to encourage people to buy and that's about their history and that's about quality but it's also just about bringing that world to life. Um, Erin, you've obviously kind of been at the the coalface of this having worked with, for, with a luxury brand for a long time that has to you know has to sell product and, and, and I think sells product online which is a kind of a big challenge I think for lots of luxury brands. Um, what, what do you think that kind of differentiating thing is? How do, that, how do luxury brands grab attention in a different way to an you know, equivalent FMCG brand, say a, a more, a more down-to-earth brand? Um, I think with a luxury strategy um, across the board, not just in copywriting, you, are, you demand that the customer chases the brand. It's not, it, it's not the other way around. Um, and you do that with authentic storytelling with richness of detail with extreme quality craftsmanship and and most importantly your heritage and your cultural roots and i think all of these come together to make an ownership of the brand a privilege you know in in fragrance for example in luxury fragrance is no longer just fragrance you know it becomes closer to an art it's like objects of desirability it's iconic and it it speaks volumes about the person that, that owns it. And I think copy and tone of voice are, are a key tool to, to communicate all of those things. And for me, it's really about understanding your values and, and sticking to those values and not deviating from them because you're chasing a customer. You stick to them because that is what you are. And, and you know, it, it, there's almost a competition doesn't exist. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to exist because you're good enough. In fact, you're you're exceptional and you're the best. Um, so yeah, and I think Penhaligon's uh, our tone of voice does that very well through understanding our values. Like I was saying, it's it's very much we we are uh, quintessentially British. We're we're um, poetic and playful. Um, we are storytellers and we have our, our, as I say, our heritage and our, our history and, and you put those things all together and the result is your very authentic tone of voice that, could, that couldn't be any other way. Yeah, right. I think that's such a true and that kind of be, be true to who you are point really um, goes back to those, you know, those personas, those different routes a luxury brand can take. I think Sam made that really good point that lots of luxury brands are defaulting to that butler but actually something that's true to them may be something very different to that. Um, I'm gonna press on just a little bit conscious of time. So the third, the third point here is leaving it to the imagination. Um, what you don't, I mean, this is a, again, it's something that applies to lots of copywriting, not just uh, luxury copywriting, but I think it's particularly true in this um, sector. Um, you can not say things and the things that you don't say um, can actually really speak volumes and can really enhance that, that luxury reputation. Um, so we did some work with 45 German Street, which is a restaurant, um, and they are a, lux a luxury brand, and this is, you're looking at a picture of their menu, which, I, I mean, it, sorry, the, the image is too small, so I can't quite see, but it's, it says fish and chips, and it says, you know, egg sandwich and things like that, with no just no further description of what those dishes are. And you can imagine another restaurant that maybe had a less luxury reputation, it would be, they would want to tell you about the, the grated truffle on the fries and they would want to tell you about the farm fresh free range eggs and all of those kind of things. Um, and the understatedness I think is a really important part of lots of luxury brands. Um, and when you do that, you can, when you do have um, little moments of flair and little moments of personality, they really pop, right? So if you pick up your drink in 45 German Street, um, you will see a little boo on the coaster 
underneath. And it's a lovely moment. It's a lovely moment, partly because they're not doing too much of that, partly because they were only doing that occasionally. So it really pops and it really grabs your attention. Um, they've they've um, taken so much away so that those moments can really shine. Um, we talked a little bit at the top about fashion brands that do this as well, you know, so they say, you know, this is Prada's Instagram feed and it's it's all like this. They say almost nothing. There's no description of the clothes. There's no where they've come from. There's no cashmere. There's no silk. There's here is a photo. Here's who took it here, where, where it is. Um, and that's obviously lots of fashion brands pursue that. Really, partly because there's a, there's a kind of cool factor that I kind of think goes along with luxury, but it's, some luxury brands are cool, some some aren't. But um, also just because I think that that idea of you bringing what what's in your head and your imagination to that brand is a really important part of um, of, of their value and of, of kind of how they differentiate themselves. So yeah, our advice would be say enough to spark a reader's attention but not quite enough to satisfy them. I think the best, the most successful luxury brands don't quite put it all out. Uh, they, they leave, they're a little bit reserved and they, they kind of leave a bit of a gap for you to fill in and for your kind of mind to bring the brand to life. So that was our, our three points there. Um, and we've got a bit of time, I think, for some questions. I don't know how that's, if, we, if you've been lighting up the chat, but um, Mike, can you tell us where we are? Yeah, we do have a few. Um, really interesting one, I thought, from uh, Robin, who is talking about asking about the storytelling aspect. And her question is, um, is it more about making luxury items more accessible? Or is it about transporting people to a different world that is inaccessible? You know, is it about making you closer, almost making it further away and more kind of mysterious? Any thoughts on that? Um, so so I'll, I'll start, but feel free to uh chip in folks so i think that's that comes kind of comes back to that question of different luxury brands are doing different we, we use this umbrella term luxury but some luxury if you are selling super yachts you might need 10 customers in a year and if you are selling you know luxury tea bags <laughs> you need to sell them to millions of people you know and it's a very it's a very different thing and so for some of those brands um it is about accessibility it's about bringing people in and making you know luxury is about kind of elevating that everyday experience and for other brands it is is really you know ex accessibility isn't really their their problem they just want to kind of you know sell to that very core group of con consumers who are kind of very engaged and i think that that may, means that storytelling is varies dramatically depending on the brand and i think you know that the audience group is, is the key determinant of that don't yeah, I, I would also just add there that it, it, it's it's if you it's if you've got a story to tell, you know, it, there's no point doing these things if if there's a, if they're not authentic, you know, it, with fragrance especially, it, you have that barrier of 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 obviously you can't smell the fragrance if you're selling online, for example. So the storytelling really helps to sort of bring the ingredients and that world to life because it because it, it, it enlivens your senses. But but only because it's authentic and it's true that you know and that these fragrances from for our point of view are are, are built from true stories um, that you can go into that to that world of storytelling. For some brands, it doesn't necessarily exist. There isn't necessarily 150 years of heritage to talk about, etc. And I don't think you you need to force that just because you're a luxury brand and you should storytell. Yeah, that's really interesting and. Um very much connects with Diane's question, um, which we may have covered, but she was asking about that sort of the problem that luxury as a word has been kind of so overused, as we've said, it's been devalued. And she asks, how do you make luxury credible through copy when people, as you say, Erin, haven't experienced your product or service yet? You know, how do you get across that really is as amazing as you want people to think? And um, we've covered a bit of this. Any further thoughts on that? I, I think, um... It's, it's look, well, one of the ways you can do it is just look for opportunities for more distinctive language. I mean, that, um, the example we saw with the Swiss watch on the left hand side, the sort of bad example, we used a phrase like decades of experience. That's another bit of language like luxury that has become so overused, it's almost meaningless and people just see it as wallpaper. But if you use a piece of language that people aren't used to seeing, it makes the reader sit up a little bit more. So I think you're right. The, the word luxury is so devalued that it, it is hard to use and hard to make it credible and authentic. 
but that's when other bits of language can come in and, and do that job and by making them a bit more eye-catching than that I think that sets you out as a brand that is doing things in a slightly different way or considering things in a slightly different way yeah absolutely um okay uh, another question here from Roseanne, which is one that we've talked about in the office, I know, which is that um, lots of luxury brands, obviously like Penn Halligans, will talk a lot about their heritage and um, when they've got one. So what do you do if you're a startup in the luxury world? You know, if you wanted to establish yourself and you don't have 100 and whatever years of history, what can language do to help with that, do we think? Um well, <laughs> you can, it's, I mean, it, it probably varies a lot for each brand. I think there's, there's, we, we kind of mapped out some of those different possibilities that a brand can take. You know, I think there's, a, there's lots of younger, successful luxury brands that have, have gone into more, that slightly more irreverent territory where they're, where they're slightly jokey and slightly tongue in cheek. I think, you know, those, those kind of esteemed um, British luxury bands with those butlerish personalities are very undercuttable by brands that are a bit cooler and and a bit sassier and a bit you know just talk in a slightly different way so I think that's one obvious thing you know make make a virtue out of your youth you're you're the you're the the young dapper dapper you know exciting um go-getting brand as opposed to the the slightly fuddy-duddy brand I think that's that's one thing that happens and um, I also think there's that kind of fashion brand um, root of just like letting, um, letting, you know, picture, you, you see this scene and, and, and it's, and it's in a photograph and it's beautiful and it's all this kind of lifestyle thing. And you say very little and you know, your, your text is very functional. The copy that you're using is much more functional. So there's, there's different, there's different routes, but I do think that, um, Erin's point before was a really good one of, you know, play to your strengths, be true to who you are, um, and use that as the foundation for, not just copy for your whole brand for everything you do because that's 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 your brand right that's that's what sets you apart and it's, it's a really nice opportunity to bring your your consumer along with you there you know you're you're starting as, as a startup but you're just starting to build your heritage and your legacy from scratch and your consumer can come along with you and i, I touched on it before but in that case i think it's values your values are so important if you can if you know them and you and you stick to them and, and, and in your path forward they're part of it then then you're you, as i say bringing your customers along on on the journey with you yeah i think that's a really good point it makes me think of um the cultivist which is a startup that we work with um when they well for a few years now they've been going but um they're basically a kind of high-end art club for collectors around the world and um so you know they had some heritage and the founders came from Sotheby's, but beyond that, there was no kind of obvious heritage to the brand itself. But as you say, it was very much the initial messaging. It was about, you know, be part of this new thing and, you know, the excitement of that and just starting on a journey. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really nice way of putting it. And of course, history is only one tool in the box, as Sam was uh, pointing out. So there are many other things we could talk about. Um, great. So somebody asked about PR, which I always think is an interesting subject. Um, so, I use a PR agency to write about my luxury brand, but they never quite get it right. How can I help? Um, any yeah. advice on working with PR? That's that's a really tricky one. I think, but particularly when the if it is a, a new brand and you're the founder or you're the sort of lead, and you feel like you've got a really clear idea of what your brand should sound like in your head, but then you you get you brief a PR agency to write something and it comes back and it doesn't sound quite right. Um, I think that's where language, because it's so slippery, can be hard to sort of pin down for someone. So, yeah, that's when thinking about the voice, thinking about what language you should use is really useful. Maybe developing some mini voice guidelines for someone to use or sending them a best pra practice example. Because um, it's hard sometimes if you're not familiar with a brand and you just come to it fresh, you might just naturally write in what you think sounds luxury, which, as we've seen, might end up sounding very old fashioned and very, very stuffy. Um, so yes, if you're working with someone who doesn't really understand your brand or the way it's meant to sound, kind of sit down with them, show them as many examples, practical examples of copy, um, so that they can then start taking that on board and putting into putting it into action in their own writing. Yeah, I, I would I would say that there's that uh, there's no shortcut to this. It, it's a lot <laughs> of a lot of time and effort at the beginning to sort of nail those those do's and don'ts and those guidelines and really get that set in your mind so that you can pass that over to other people to be able to just sort of pick up your brand immediately. But that really comes from, 
from your graft at the beginning, to be honest. Yeah, great. Um, okay, we've got a really timely question here from Diane on the chat. Um, is sustainability and the drive for greater transparency a challenge um, in luxury? Um, she suggests that luxury is a, uh, a bit of smoke and mirrors, which I think is probably not, not unfair. Um, so you know, what do we do about those sustainability issues and transparency issues? Erin, it'd be really interesting to see what you think about that. So it comes back to being to that to being authentic again and being honest and and also agile and adaptable and understanding that the world is always changing and yes of course you've got your key values and your all these guidelines in place but you have to be flexible and nimble as a brand and um you have to move forward in the ways that 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 you as a brand feel are the right things to do honestly you know and this is talking as a luxury brand and, and talking as a as a um I can't talk across the board and, and obviously as you touched on earlier brands are there to sell product but when you have again these core key values then you have to adapt them to the modern world around you or you are going to become that stuffy old-fashioned brand and just because from our point of view we've got 150 of years of heritage it doesn't mean that we are always going to do things the old fashioned way. It doesn't mean that we're not going to champion the future because you'd be a fool to not adapt and, and, and go with it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I'm just about to squeeze one more in, I think. Um, again, sort of very much about the contemporary world. Uh, Cherry has asked, um, how does the kind of less is more approach that luxury brands tend to use translate into social? You know, we saw some social earlier where there's basically no copy or very functional copy. Um, but obviously social is about constantly updating your messaging. So what, what's the balance to be struck there? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. I think you know, the examples we pulled were of brands that I think have done that very successfully. A lot of fashion brands do that successfully but that's partly because they have built up a reputation, right? And they can you, can, you could easily argue that Prada can afford to say nothing because they're Prada and people know Prada and what, what more do you need to say? And I think that's actually something that we've not talked about a huge amount, but that is a big thing in luxury is that like existing brand equity really affects how much you can do. Um, and this, you know, I think that's, um, that speaks to the fact that I think, you know, young brands, that young luxury brands probably need to, to feel this out a little bit and it might, it might change over time a little bit and that's okay as long as it's kind of a considered change that's about how, how that brand is representing itself and how it grows and how well known that brand is to people, then that makes complete sense. So I think that probably is more of a challenge to pull off for a new brand, but I, I think that, that navigating that change is, um, requires good writing and requires that kind of real looking back at your values and why you're there and, and why you exist. But um, I do think that's, yeah, that's something that can be overcome. Yeah, I mean, and, and the social is, is such a, it's a super visual channel, right? It, it's very much about combining the, the copy or lack of copy with what visuals you're putting over. It becomes much more of a, um, a, a, joint, a joint effort with the, with the imagery as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Instagram obviously is super visual. And um, I'm just thinking we did some social campaigns for Bottega Veneta a while ago. And um, there was a good example there of using the copy alongside quite slightly kind of eccentric visuals that they had to, to add to that eccentricity. And the, the captions we did at the time were kind of a little bit Penhaligans y actually, you know, kind of slightly off center, a bit kind of odd but fun and uh, you know okay. you can do a lot with a very short bit of copy on an Instagram post to add to the quality of even a very established brand like that so um, there's plenty you can do and you don't just have to be minimalist I don't think. Um, okay we're just over our time limit so I will draw a line there. Sam do you want to wrap up? Sure yeah great well, well thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, we're going to be posting this on our YouTube channel um, and you'll find it on our website and on our social channels as well. Um, next week is our final uh, webinar of this season where we're going to be talking about writing for the arts and culture sectors. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, guests from the Royal Academy of Arts and the South Park Centre here in London. Um, so we'll look at the sort of challenges and opportunities that writing for the arts brings. Um, 
if you'd like us to cover anything else, if you think anything else would be interesting, please drop us a line. Um, we're going to send around a survey after this. So if you had a couple of minutes, we'd, we'd love to know what you thought and if there's anything else you think we could cover in the future. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I'd like to say thanks very much for your time uh, and have a good rest of the day.